What was it like to live in the Wild West? By 1865, over 30,000 miles of train tracks crisscrossed the United States. With the Civil War over and many people unshackled from slavery, millions of Americans explored the West, looking to find a new home and riches. The idea of manifest destiny emboldened others. One 19th century historian famously described the new frontier as the meeting point between savagery and civilization. It wasn't an exaggeration. This era was unlike any other time in American history. These are the most incredible facts about the Wild West. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Let's go. It was customary to photograph dead outlaws. Life as an outlaw in the unforgiving terrain of the Wild West was a treacherous path, with most criminals destined to meet their end in unmarked graves. However, an intriguing challenge faced those trying to convince a skeptical public that these notorious wrongdoers were truly deceased. In response, an unlikely solution emerged, photography. This not only served the practical purpose of documenting deceased outlaws for legal and reward confirmation, but also played a role in calming the nerves of local communities. What added an even more unsettling layer to this practice was the manner in which these lifeless outlaws were portrayed in photographs, often in an upright position, propped against a wall. Photographers had to work with great haste, capturing these images while the bodies were still in their post-mortem state, just before rigor mortis would set in. The enduring mythology of some outlaws managed to outlive their physical existence, heightening the significance of photographic evidence. In the case of the notorious outlaw Bill Dalton's demise, one exasperated newspaper, frustrated by its incredulous readership, responded with a headline that could easily be mistaken for a piece from satirical publication, The Onion, Mr. Dalton undeniably deceased. In the Wild West, a region known for its resilience and skepticism, the population bore the original picks or it didn't happen mentality. Even in the face of life's most gruesome realities, they demanded photographic proof to quell their doubts. People took their cows very seriously. In the rugged frontier of the Old West, perhaps even more destructive than the notorious outlaws were the relentless range wars. Nowhere were these violent conflicts more prevalent than in the vast expanses of Montana, Wyoming, and Texas. Out on the open range, there were few things as valuable as land and cattle, as fortunes were made and shattered over the vast herds of bovine. Often, these clashes had their origins in disputes between powerful cattle empires, sometimes backed by British or Scottish conglomerates, and the hard-working homesteaders. These were quintessential battles between small local businesses and corporate giants, albeit with a distinct cowboy twist. Whether the skirmish was dubbed a feud or escalated into a full-blown range war, the results were usually the same, bloodshed and a feud that could simmer for years sometimes even passing through generations. These Western-style blood feuds were perpetuated by family ties and an unyielding determination to maintain one's pride. Interestingly, disputes over cattle or horses often masked deeper tensions and provided an excuse for violent conflict. The bitter aftermath of the Civil War left a trail of disgruntled Southerners, their smoldering resentment further fueling these feuds and wars. Notable examples of these intense conflicts include the Sutton-Taylor feud, the Graham-Tewksbury feud, also referred to as the Pleasant Valley War, and the Horrell-Higgins feud, each with its own unique blend of drama, bloodshed, and historical significance. Not every woman was a prostitute. It should be self-evident but it's worth noting, especially considering the frequency with which female characters in Western fiction are portrayed as practitioners of the world's oldest profession. In reality, women on the frontier led incredibly diverse lives. They served as doctors, ranchers, entrepreneurs, and even ran their own businesses, including brothels. Many of them were devoted wives and mothers, while others defied conventions and took on the roles of outlaws, 
and contrary to common misconceptions, saloon girls and hurdy-gurdies were not interchangeable terms for prostitutes. They represented distinct professions. Prostitution itself was a multifaceted industry with a hierarchical structure that was strictly upheld by the women involved. At the top of the ladder were those working in high-end parlor houses, while at the bottom were the crib girls who had to cater to multiple clients each night just to make ends meet. Unfortunately, given the unforgiving nature of the profession, upward mobility was almost non-existent. Instead, women who aged poorly or fell victim to venereal diseases were left with only one direction to go, downward. The romanticized notion of a prostitute marrying a client and escaping her profession rarely led to a happily ever after ending. More often than not, it was plagued by suspicions of infidelity and ended in disappointment. It was illegal to drink alcohol in Indian territory. The prohibition of alcohol sales to Native Americans had roots dating back to 1802. However, it wasn't until 1832 that Congress passed a comprehensive law banning alcohol entirely from Indian territory. One judge attempted to frame this law as a means of preserving order in the Indian tribes and maintaining peace between them and the frontier settlers. While this explanation may sound benevolent, a more concerning motive becomes apparent upon closer examination, and the preservation of the existence of these savages. It is evident that the United States government had questionable intentions when it came to the welfare of native people. Just as the 20th century prohibition era led to the rise of organized crime, alcohol prohibition in Indian territory gave rise to various smuggling operations, particularly along its Kansas border. Native individuals who sought to consume or purchase alcoholic beverages were forced to cross the border to do so. However, those judged to be inebriated were prohibited from engaging in trade business, creating a paradox. Furthermore, the law was nearly impossible to enforce, especially considering that the various tribes were not consulted prior to its enactment. Far from the protective measure some judges claimed it to be, evidence suggests that alcohol prohibition caused a myriad of other problems, ultimately causing more harm than good to the Midwestern tribes. Agents at Express were badass. Numerous U.S. Marshals have rightfully earned their reputation as unyielding individuals but it's essential to acknowledge the bravery of those who guarded express cars on trains. After the Civil War, train robbery became a lucrative industry for many outlaws, and the prime target was often a train's express car. Inside this car, one would find an express agent responsible for safeguarding a substantial amount of money. The agent's duty was straightforward, defend the express car at any cost, which included barricading the door and, if necessary, confronting any robber who managed to breach the car. Regrettably, outlaws frequently resorted to extreme measures, such as attempting to blow up the barricaded door. This reckless action often resulted in the injury or even death of the agent inside. In one particular incident, to avoid such a grim fate, an express agent decided to deceive an outlaw by allowing them inside, making it seem like a surrender. But when the opportunity arose, the agent wielded an ice maul, striking the unsuspecting bandit on the head. This act revealed that the agent was anything but passive or peaceable. Camels once roamed the range. Years before the Transcontinental Railroad became a reality, there was an unusual belief that camels could facilitate westward expansion in the United States. While horses were an integral part of Western culture, camels were considered valuable due to their endurance and ability to carry heavy loads for long distances. Their adaptability, honed through millions of years of desert life, made them seemingly suitable for the less harsh conditions of the American West. In the 1840s and 1850s, Supply trains began employing camels for shorter journeys across various regions, ranging from Texas to Washington. A significant event in this period was when Edward Fitzgerald Beale led a group of camels from the Midwest on a remarkable 1-200-mile journey to California, just north of Los Angeles. Pioneers quickly took notice of this feat. Confederate Major Henry Wayne was among those who expressed their optimism about the potential of camels. 
he stated, Americans will be able to manage camels not only as well, but better than Arabs, as they will do it with more humanity and with far greater intelligence. Setting aside the racial prejudices of the era, the statement reflected a positive outlook on the contributions camels could make to the challenging journey across the West. In 1857, the United States government purchased hundreds of camels for logistical purposes and stationed them in Texas. However, they soon forgot about these camels for a few years, until the outbreak of the Civil War. At that point, opportunistic Confederates in Texas seized the camels and put them to use for military purposes, leading to the formation of the Camel Corps. These camels had various roles, including delivering mail and transporting goods throughout the region. Some were captured and sold for profits used to purchase war supplies. A famous camel named Old Douglas, from the 43rd Mississippi Infantry, gained recognition after sustaining fatal injuries during the Siege of Vicksburg. Ultimately, the Camel Corps did not prove to be effective for the Confederate cause. Camels, despite their capabilities in carrying loads over long distances, were deemed slow and temperamental. Horses for transportation and mules for supplies were found to be more efficient workhorses for the war effort. However, after the war, wild camels that had been released into the American West began to roam freely. One notable example was the Red Ghost, which inhabited the harsh Arizona desert. The Red Ghost's legend grew over time, encompassing tall tales and even stories of causing harm to humans. However, Wild camels did not establish a permanent presence in North America. As the West was progressively settled, the few dozen remaining wild camels eventually died out and faded into obscurity. Cowboys saw aliens. While we often associate alien abduction stories and UFO sightings with recent times due to the proliferation of technology, the truth is that such claims date back centuries, these reports were not uncommon even in the Wild West of the United States. One of the most remarkable alleged encounters with extraterrestrials occurred in 1896 in the frontier town of Lodi, California. H.G. Shaw, a Civil War veteran and journalist, claimed that he and a friend witnessed a group of extraterrestrial beings. Shaw recounted this incident in the local newspaper, describing the otherworldly characters as seven feet tall and very slender with small hands, fingers without nails, and feet twice as long as normal, functioning similarly to a monkey's feet. Shaw didn't stop at describing the appearance of these aliens. He also had a theory about their purpose for visiting. He proposed that these beings were inhabitants of Mars, who had been sent to Earth to obtain one of its inhabitants. This idea may sound familiar to those who have followed more recent alien abduction stories, as many of them share similar themes. However, Shaw's account wasn't the only UFO-related event to unsettle the Wild West. A year after the Lodi incident, residents of the small town of Aurora, Texas, reported sightings of cigar-shaped flying saucers in the sky. A few months later, they claimed that a UFO had fallen from the heavens and exploded in the middle of their town. While skeptics attributed this event to a meteorite, rumors of an alien visit persisted in the town for years. Small-town life in the Wild West offered an environment where intriguing observations, whether born out of isolation or boredom, could lead to stories of UFO encounters. While the authenticity of these claims remains a subject of debate, they certainly add a layer of mystery and fascination to the history of the American West. The most famous alien-related event, the Roswell Incident, occurred in 1947, well after the Wild West era had ended. More recently, the Marfa Lights have continued to capture our fascination with the possibility of extraterrestrial phenomena. Gamblers put modern wagering to shame. Gambling has been an integral part of American life, from the enduring appeal of Las Vegas to the emergence of online sports betting in recent times. This tradition dates back to the Old West, where being something of a gambler at heart was almost a prerequisite for heading westward. 
pioneers embarking on the journey to the West, were already gambling with their lives, given the many dangers they faced along the way. As people reached the Wild West, it was only natural for them to engage in card games to pass the time and try to earn a few dollars to survive. Gambling became so deeply woven into the fabric of Western life that it gained the status of a respected profession. Similar to doctors, saloon keepers, lawyers, and other business owners, card sharks and gamblers were esteemed for their skills. As one historian famously noted, in the early West, gambling was considered a profession, as legitimate a calling as the clergy, the law, or medicine. Throughout the Western frontier, high-stakes games and the allure of substantial winnings drew full-time gamblers. These individuals would travel from town to town, earning their livelihood at the card table. Some gamblers turned to cheating and underhanded tactics to defeat unsuspecting locals, collecting their winnings and leaving town swiftly to avoid capture. In California, professional gambling became akin to a way of life. Card players flocked to the region throughout the 19th century, offering their skills in exchange for cash. Eventually, California evolved into a destination for many men seeking to explore the western frontier while pursuing their passion for gambling. The West's Wild Whiskey Woes Whiskey was a popular choice of libation for those living on the frontier, providing a comforting drink amidst the rugged backdrop of the Old West. However, the whiskeys available at the time would likely not appeal to modern palates. They carried intriguing names such as Forty Rods, Tarantula Juice, Taos Lightning, and a variety of exotic-sounding concoctions, yet the truth of their composition was rather astonishing. These spirits were incredibly potent and contained ingredients that were often unbelievable, including dangerous elements like strychnine. Other liquors featured ingredients such as turpentine and tobacco oil. For many, the first shot of these liquors was so harsh that it necessitated a second one just to wash away the taste and forget about the initial experience. After a couple of rounds, if the drinker could endure it, they would become so inebriated that they'd lose track of what they were consuming, often drifting into a chemical-induced slumber only to repeat the cycle the following day. From a logistical perspective, this might not come as a surprise. Western saloons were frequently few and far between, and the vast distances between towns, along with inconsistent supply lines, made it challenging to provide consistent, high-quality liquor. Furthermore, during the 19th century, there were virtually no food or beverage regulations enforced throughout the West. In the absence of standardized rules governing the composition of whiskey, Saloon keepers exercised their creative freedom when crafting their offerings. Cowboys were more diverse than in the movies. The iconic image of the gunslinging cowboy riding freely across the Wild West is deeply ingrained in American culture. However, this popular image often leaves out significant historical truths. One of the lesser known facts is that as many as one in four cowboys in the Wild West were black. The story of black cowboys in the West traces back to the early 1800s when wealthy American enslavers migrated to Texas, which was initially part of Spain and later Mexico. They brought a substantial number of enslaved people with them to support the burgeoning cattle ranches. Even in 1825, during a period when Texas was still part of anti-slavery Mexico, enslaved individuals comprised about 25% of the settler population. These ranch owners, many of whom would go on to fight for the Confederacy in the Civil War, depended on enslaved labor to manage their cattle herds. However, after the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863, which made slavery illegal, Texas had become a part of the United States in 1845, ranchers faced a growing problem of runaway cattle. It was the recently freed black Americans who had been enslaved on these cattle ranches that possessed valuable skills in wrangling cattle. This sudden supply of skilled cowboys became incredibly sought after, and many of them decided to pursue careers as cowboys. Despite encountering significant discrimination on ranches, in towns, and out on the plains, 
These black cowboys formed strong bonds with their white and Mexican counterparts in cowboy crews. The legacy of black cowboys in the Wild West is a testament to their resilience and the essential role they played in shaping the American frontier. What historical fact about the Old West surprises you the most? I'm sure there are many intriguing aspects to explore. From gunfights to unique top ten lists and even wild stories like those involving camels. Be sure to subscribe to our channel for more content. If you take Bulow and the rest of your men, it might be a good idea to get out of Dodge.